Hello and welcome to the Cancer News video series. I am your host, Richa Parikh. I'm a second year hematology oncology fellow at Carmanos Cancer Institute in Detroit, Michigan. Today, we are going to be talking to Dr. Shaji Kumar, a renowned expert in the field of multiple myeloma and plasma cell disorders. Dr. Kumar is currently a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. His research focuses on improving understanding of the disease biology, thereby allowing for better identification of therapeutic targets and development of novel therapeutic agents in myeloma. He also investigates the prevalence on certain biomarkers for progression of monoclonal chemopathies. He has authored several peer-reviewed publications, and we are so thankful for his work that has helped improve outcomes for innumerable myeloma patients. Dr. Kumar, welcome to our show. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me on this uh, meeting. All right. So let's jump into today's episode and hear the expert's opinion on certain topics that we have picked. So Dr. Kumar, how do you approach MGUS in the year 2023? Do you use the iStock multiple myeloma risk model or the Mayo criteria? Yeah, I think um, the key thing with the monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, obviously, is to make sure that we have the right diagnosis. So as we all know, this is a spectrum of disorders um, ranging from you know, clearly monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance with no endogen damage to a variety of different disorders, most common ones that we deal in the clinic being myeloma and amyloidosis. But there are also other uh, uncommon disorders that can be associated with the presence of a monoclonal uh, gammopathy or um, monoclonal plasma cells. Um, and these are not very common and sometimes are missed um, and can include a variety of uh, neurological conditions like Poem syndrome. There are skin conditions that can be associated with it um, and certain neurological um, uh, issues like peripheral neuropathy as well. So I think the key thing is to make sure that we are dealing with a monoclonal gammopathy that is not doing anything bad to the patient in, if, in any form or fashion. And that clearly requires us to do a very complete workup. So, and a complete workup at the time of diagnosis clearly includes uh, the typical hematological um, testing we do, like CBC, the metabolic parameters, uh, making sure we do the serum and uh, 24 a urine protein electrophoresis to identify monoclonal protein in the blood and in the urine and to quantitate them, and the immunofixation in, uh, in both uh, blood and urine in order to identify the type of monoclonal protein that is associated uh, with it. Now, the initial workup uh, of, mon of muggers or in an individual where you have identified a monoclonal protein depends to some extent how you ended up finding it. Of course, if you are doing a comprehensive battery of tests and you notice an abnormal abnormally elevated total protein or an elevated ESR, patient is totally asymptomatic or the person is totally asymptomatic and you end up um, doing the electrophoresis or nimina fixation and identifies a monoclonal protein, there it may be a different approach uh, compared to somebody whom you are actively screening for monoclonal protein because they presented with a particular clinical symptomatology that points towards what possible presence of monoclonal gammopathy. So uh, in the first uh, scenario where you just incidentally stumbled upon a monoclonal protein, um, the, the workup could be a little bit more limited because clearly if none of those initial workup showed any, anything else concerning and you identify the monoclonal protein quantitated and if it's small and you, you know, then you may not do any additional workup over and above what we just talked about. Now, to some extent, the, uh, the, the, or the extent of workup that we do for this monoclonal proteins also depends on some or uh, you know, some factors, particularly the the amount of monoclonal protein, right? So if you have someone with a very high M spike, um, then we certainly do a more um, thorough workup um, to rule out, you know, to distinguish this from a active myeloma or small ring myeloma, and that will all will include in addition to the blood and urine test a bone marrow in many of these patients and also uh, specific imaging to make sure that there is there are no bone lesions and maybe even advanced uh, imaging technique to make sure there are no bone marrow-based lesions. Um, so based on that initial workup, obviously in, uh, we can group these uh, individuals into having just purely monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. Is it small ring myeloma? Is it active myeloma? Or is it somebody with uh, light chain amyloidosis or any of the other um, less common conditions. And of course, if somebody were to be worked up for a specific symptom, then obviously we'll do more extensive workups. So if someone came with neuropathy, we would certainly do more EMG and there may be even a nerve biopsy in some of these patients in order to make a specific diagnosis. 
Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, now, just a follow-up question on that. So uh, what would be the indications for a bone marrow biopsy in a patient with MGAS? Right. So it varies quite a bit. It depends on the practice. And as I'm sure you have seen, um, uh, some um, institutions might do bone marrow biopsy on majority of the patients. Uh, others might do a more risk-adapted approach. For us, it is typically based on what is the uh, the risk associated with progression. Um, and I know we just kind of briefly touched upon that in your previous, in your previous question. The um, So if someone has a very small M spike, um, and we think, especially we think technologies like the mass spectrometry, we can identify even smaller and smaller monoclonal proteins. So um, when you think about the risk factors, a high M spike is a risk factor for progression non-IgG type of monoclonal uh, proteins and increased risk factor. And obviously, you know, the bone marrow plasma cell percentage is, but just based on the type of the M spike, um, the uh, the height of the M spike, and also the serum-free light chain levels and the ratio, we usually use those three indicators to decide whether a bone marrow biopsy is indicated. So if somebody has less than a gram M spike, um, if they have an IgG uh, monoclonal protein and their serum-free light chains are, you know, no, the ratio is normal or close to normal, we often don't do a bone marrow biopsy in those patients because the risk of progression is so small. And of course, if those patients, those numbers change rapidly over a over the period of observation, then we will certainly go back and ask that, you know, um, question whether we need to do a bone marrow. Now, um, once you do the bone marrow biopsy, um, then obviously those findings there might dictate what additional testing you might do. So if somebody has um, obviously, you know, none that is detectable or maybe one or two percent plasma cells, then you worry less about the risk of progression. On the other hand, if they are more closer to that small ring myeloma threshold, you know, eight, nine percentage, then I think you're more likely to jump into more comprehensive workup, including more sensitive imaging. Now, having said that, I think when you have someone with a monoclonal tomopathy, at least in my own practice, I often tend to get an imaging in the majority of the patients, nearly all of them, because it's not invasive. And it also forms a really good baseline for us to assess changes that might occur in the future, which in turn might drive how we approach a given patient. Thank you so much. And another follow-up question to that is what kind of diagnostic modality in terms of imaging modality would you prefer for further workup? Would you prefer like a PET CT or a whole body MRI or CT scans? Right. So right now I would say the minimum that we should get is a whole body load or CT scan. And that will allow us to get a very comprehensive assessment and a sensitive assessment of the bone uh, for any kind of lytic lesions. Um, the skeletal survey is what we used to do before, but uh, you can miss almost 25% of the patients with lesions by using a, a skeletal, skeletal survey compared to uh, using a whole body load or CT scan. Now, obviously there are disadvantages to the whole body load or CT scan. Obviously it doesn't, uh, it is less likely to show any soft tissue disease. Uh, it certainly does not give you a good assessment of the bone marrow. So ideally, I think a functional study like a PET CT would be, would be of greatest value. And whether what, which one you end up doing also depends on your clinical suspicion as to whether are you dealing with the mothers or are you dealing with something more than just your mothers. So I think if there is certainly suspicion for myeloma, I think my preference would be to try and get a baseline PET CT for all the reasons we just talked about, because it allows you to explore the bone windows for lytic lesions, but also tells you if there are bone marrow areas in the bone marrow that are taking up the uh, FDG um, and also whether there's any soft tissue disease. Now, there are other imaging modalities which can be of value. And of course, uh, you know, the revised um, criteria for diagnosis of myeloma also allows for making the diagnosis based on known lytic lesions that can be seen in the bone marrow, particularly on MRI on this, of the spine. Mm -hmm. So in, if you have a patient where, let's say you're suspecting, um, you, you think after all the work of it looks like small ring myeloma, you did a uh, whole body load or CT scan and you don't really see anything uh, abnormal. But if he's somebody who is kind of pretty close to you know being a myeloma, let's say 40% plasma cells, or has a M spike that's high or significantly um, altered free light chain ratio, uh, but not quite meeting that criteria for myeloma, doing an MRI um, of the spine could really help us kind of put that patient more towards myeloma versus more towards smoldering and gives us an added 
sense of security as to that we are truly dealing with something that uh, uh, which does not need treatment right now. Thank you so much. That is very helpful. And uh, I would say last question for today. So what reference range do you follow for light chain values in individuals with reduced kidney function? Right. So I think that is a very important question because um, when you think about the free light chain uh, levels, um, the ranges have been based on normal you know, normal individuals. And we know that renal function can affect the uh, ex removal of the or excretion of the serum free light chains. And hence, uh, both kappa and lambda tends to go up, maybe preferably you know, more so with kappa than lambda. Um, so the ratio might also get skewed a little bit, just barely outside the normal range. So more recently, there have been publications that have been looking at um, what the renal um, insufficiency, the range should be in the setting of renal insufficiency. Um, and that's particularly relevant for myeloma because you have many of these patients with some renal insufficiency secondary to the myeloma itself. So that's one thing. And second is there have also been some changes in the assay parameters itself that over the years, some of these numbers have drifted up. So if you have somebody with a slightly abnormal kappa and lambda with maybe a very borderline abnormal free light chain ratio, if the serum immunofixation is negative and a 24 hour urine immunofixation is negative, I would uh, consider that is probably um, uh, un, uh, not indicative of a monoclonal comorbidity. And I would just continue to watch those. So I think you, you really have to take that in the, you can certainly use the expanded range for renal dysfunction, but even in that setting, I would con consider that in the context of other um, clinical and laboratory parameters. Thank you so much. That is very helpful information. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your opinion on these important topics. That's all for today. This is Richa Parikh signing off.